Welcome back. This is part three of a series. All sorts of things I've spoken about before in a slightly different context. But as I've said to you all before, I mean when questions come to me to readdress the same things. Gamble's comment to me once was, I don't teach, I inculcate. Do you know what that means? He says it means I repeat it. Do you, do you get it? <laughs> I think he said to you, you can't even think any other way. Well, I don't, I'm not a brainwasher, but uh, it's easier to have other ideas in your head, to hear these things and to not hear other ones. How should have clarify what this mindset is that we are in here? Okay, so let's go to Sean's question. Uh, and by the way, again, David and Daniel, thank you so much for your contributions here for this series. I'm allowing that you guys are the two guys that are contributing to this series. So um, here's Sean, student, present time to, with me. I wonder what you've found to be the top five or 10 most challenging things to articulate to your students. Well, this is, these are in that class. They're also then in the class of what are the most common problematical obstacles you've found consistent with all your students. They're the same group of things, right? I, it's hard to articulate. And so you can say easy to, easy to understand, hard to do. Not necessarily so easy to understand. It's easy to misunderstand. But doing it and doing it, which, and, and doing it consistently, which is even more important, that's, that's where the student really has got to, you know, what's the word, buckle down, the old uh, disciplinarian model. And what are the most challenging aspects of sharing this method with your students? Yeah, the, I, I did, as I had before, the most challenging aspect of this is the fact that I, lots of these, the phrasings and things, even the word visual order is not there in the lexicon uh, of, of any painter I've ever run into before. Um, it's, I found it in Putfarkin's book on composition, and it is, it's there in other literature. But I haven't learned this. It wasn't a word offered to me, and I only use it because of the significance of the methodology that I found myself in by following the concept, the Boston School concept of painting as if you were coming out of a fog. That gave a sense of one, two, three to this, but the fog is that thing which if you blur your eyes, blur, blur, blur until everything's black and then slowly open, you'll see the first two or three points on your, in your little field. That's, those are the things you might want to try painting if you want to begin to understand what I've been talking about. Anyway, just a quick review. We've talked about the naive eye. We've talked about seeing flat, not 3D. We've talked about uh, the idea of getting a concept every minute and then debriefing to see if you've actually accomplished, if, there, if you've managed to put down the concept. And then finally, on that first one, we, did one, we talked about maintaining the unity of the general impression, the unity of whatever you're painting, making sure that no matter what you put down, it's in harmony with what's already there. Then we talked about the blurred eye, and that's what I just spoke about a second ago, the back straggler only discipline. So doing the back straggler, don't work where you feel like working, work on the back straggler and work on it. And by the way, I gotta say something about the back straggler. There, there is a time when you really have everything in unity, but the painting isn't developed. And at that point, you can reach forward. So I would say, when I say back straggler only, you can reach forward and say about the center of interest, I'm gonna evolve you a little bit more. I'm gonna start with you to bring on the next level of data. Because if I go out of harmony with nature, I wanna do it on the basis of the strongest guys leading, okay? Hope that's a thought you can follow. So in that way, I would say, it isn't back straggler only, unless you mean to say that the center of interest should be more impressive than it is, might make it a back straggler. How to simultaneously maintain 2D spatial relationships plus the order that gives you the third D, the visual order of effects. Avoiding simplistic, linear, one, two, three thinking rather than, you know, putting two notes down and then consolidating and, and working back and correcting all the previous ones. And that takes a knee bent thing that we talk about, and I suppose that's coming up next. But so there's four more here. And uh, these are the thoughts for part three for today. Um, so to worry first about what and secondly, where? Now, I've addressed this before a little bit, but that is stating visual content for the purpose of seeing where it goes and then moving it. So that's what I addressed in the last one where I said, don't you realize you get to this point, and even in your cast drawings, where suddenly you have enough content to see the, how screwed up it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Enough total content. I'm trying to get us to get, you know, to, 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 to make the content visually true, make it like. Value, edge, shape, 
and location and all that sort of stuff. But get the effect first and allow it, in conversation with other effects, to, f to, to show, excuse me, to show you how they're out of harmony and how they might be corrected. Oh, it's going to be a good day if I keep doing this. The second, um, so, uh, so, but then be, but then be ready and willing to move it. That's the keeping your knees bent, keeping mobile and knee bent tentativeness. That's what the next point is. So I've addressed that somewhat, um, the flexibility in that two steps forward, three steps back thing. But avoiding premature, absolute certainty for a posture of negotiation. Okay. So writing is rewriting is a hard thing for every students come in and they just want it to be like it and they want to be like it right now. So what they do is they go around drawing, but the likeness isn't there in the values or in the colors or anything else, but they're beginning to get it in the drawing. Well, what we're trying to do is get it in all phases and it does require a considerable bit more, more agility, shall we say? flexibility. So if you can keep that, I, this is one that I find students have a difficult time with, you know. So you have to make a good statement. That was one that Sean and I were talking about actually just today. You have to make a very articulate statement. Make it, as Bonat says in his rule, what I'm calling Bonat's rule from Gamel, make it as like as you can the first time. Now, it doesn't mean torture yourself and sit on it and sit on it and think, I can make it better, I can make it better. No, as like as you can the first time. First time is you're going through it and you're putting this down. Do the very best you can the first time, but don't spend a week and a half on the first mark you make, like top and bottom. We don't need that. We need you to make it, give it a summary statement. Okay, the very best you can do, a summary statement so you can get the top of the head talking to the bottom of the foot, right? And then you come to the other one and you make it as like as you can and you start negotiating, okay? And every time you bring a new thing in, you start negotiating, okay? So that's the knee-bent flexibility, but you want to, don't avoid making these particular parts as like as you can. So this is similar to what I was talking about before, but it gives us another sort of attack uh, posture uh, angle. Um, but, but avoid premature absolute certainty, right? You, you want to make a statement that's as like as you can get it, but you're going to put it here? You're going to try to put it there. You're going to claim that it's going to be there, but you're allowing that once you get two other things in there, that's probably might, that might very well move it when you don't see the relationships of the three together doing the right thing. And that's where I got to get you all to maintain the flexibility. Be willing to negotiate. Be ready to negotiate, right? Not, not to make it less true or rationalize. Well, if this is there, well, this is not. No, you've got, you're looking at the three now as a set. And that's where you get a concept of how they relate to each other. And if they don't do it well so that they have their unity, as soon as you put the third thing in, your job is to correct to the, to the set of all three, all three at once. So that's what I'm saying is where you got to maintain your, uh, and, but it's very similar to the one before where we said, um, oh, you know, it wasn't the first one. Yeah. I have covered this. That's all right. <laughs> Let me not waste your time. So let's go to three. Uh, and this is establishing anchors for each of the horses, getting all the horses going at once and being all over the place at once in the start. Now, establishing anchors is a big deal and um, students will just put something plausible down, but they won't establish it by, for example, as soon as you put down a note, say, should that be more red, more yellow, more blue? Establish it, right? But if you're putting down, for example, colors, one of the things you're doing is you're finding out what's the darkest dark, the lightest light, what's the most chromatic. Now, the color is values, by the way. In our world, it's color values. So you're doing the color of the lightest light, right? You're doing the value and the color, in, including the intensity of the lightest light, and that of the darkest dark. You see how holistic we are right from the beginning. And uh, But you're trying to anchor. You're saying, okay, this is dark, black as black goes, but it's got no color in it. I'm going to have to lighten it up. I'm going to have to put this in until the color gets better and I can see it better because when I look at the hole, I can see that color better. So I'm going to key it. I'm keying my dark as dark to a dark that isn't black and holds no color. I'm going to key it to a, till it's the right color value, okay? That's anchoring the dark. And the light is like unto it, right? You paint with white and you won't get any color in the white. So you don't. You paint to the color of the white. And that tells you the other end of the, of the range, right? They're anchors at both ends. And you could say we're now anchoring the values to both of those, right? Really securing them to each other. 
So uh, if you follow that just about that, now if we say chroma, we're talking about color now, mostly, right? Color values, not talking about location. We're talking about chroma. We're saying what's the most intense color out there. Now, if you're painting, say a rose, you're gonna, that's going to be the most difficult thing in your picture typically because those, are, those, those reds are hard to come by. You can do quinacridone and all sorts of wonderful stuff. But you're going to have to approximate this color. And you're saying, what's the most intense? I can manage to create this, to make this color uh, and, and, and have it you know, at the right value and have it stand and become you know, the landmark. <laughs> So, you're, so, so as much as I'm saying there's no absoluteness, there is some reach to try to create anchors, right? And you'd like them to be absolute, but you've got to do more research. Or you're going to get around. So you say, let the anchor be this. Now, in the color range, sometimes those things are just forced on you. But if it turns out you can get more chroma by making that color lighter, you might have to renegotiate a lot of things. But understand, the idea is that in every area, so all the horses is chroma, values, uh, lightest light, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a fax, and just the list, you know, whatever it is, they're, they're anchors for each of them. You know, the anchor, oddly enough, for, for um, angles is vertical. That's already established for you. But some people will take the trouble, and Gamble, I think, was more, one of those people more in that category who would try to find a couple of things that are actually lined up vertically. I don't do that sort of thing, but I do, I do, I'm, I'm always aware of what point on the canvas is the one that I'm relating everything to. So if I'm choosing, like it's a long landscape, a still life, I will grab spots on either end of it and say these things because the way they hit the frame, I'm going to have to decide on them, okay? So you're anchoring to the frame, to the, to the great dimension of the still life, anchoring it to the frame, and you're going to be at, trying to find an anchor for the top and bottom space. You know, where's it going to locate? And so instead of top and bottom, you're anchoring to one because you need to negotiate still to get the width to the length. So, but do you see how these are anchors? So, so space, location in space, the size of the thing is going to be, where it's going to be up and down. You're trying to anchor all these things. So there's a process going on here. And these are all the horses. So, and it requires you being all over the place in the start to do it, right? So we're anchoring the left to the right just to talk about this is going to be the, the, the greatest dimension. We're going to anchor to that size. This is going to be the size. So if you're doing a portrait, you're saying the head shall be such and such, but if you're doing a standing figure, you might say the top of the head's going to be here and the bottom is here, and you're anchoring so all the sizes of the subdivisions, you know, where the shirt line is or where the neckline is also is a function of that long height that's been predetermined. You've been anchored to it, okay? But you have to be all over the place. Uh, so no matter what you're doing, if you're trying to get the color, you've got to get the, color, the chroma here, but you're trying to get the color scheme is one of the things we're doing. So you're saying, what's my most chromatic, darkest, dark, lightest lights? And you, then you begin to set guys up and seeing if you can make that world work based on those first three ideas and get yourself round and round and round all over the place. Enough data so you can begin. And, and don't close the canvas up. Leave the canvas mostly white or significantly white. And don't try to make things touch each other yet. But you're going round and round just trying to get the, the field to show up as the color scheme. We're trying to anchor to the color scheme. All right. Uh, that's a funny thing to say, but it's but it's real. So, but you have to be all the place to even begin to do that. You follow? Okay. Now, the last one I'm going to talk about is called finishing the start. I think I'm staying within the range. I'm a little long. But finishing the start. What I mean by that is, then, then this is this is Paul. And you might say, via the Boston School, the Boston School paintings are done when the canvas is covered. They say the start is done when the canvas is covered. But, and I say that, so do you, what students, this typically will try to do is they'll just stay in the start. They never go past the start. What I'm trying to find out is in the first three hours, I'm trying to get the canvas covered and get the parts all well related to each other in the significant greater relationships of all the parts. So I can see the color scheme, I can see the composition. I have the visual order because of the power of the edge relationships and the rightness of all those things. And, and what I'm trying to do is cause that start to show what the entire painting is gonna be. It's really essentially, the, it's gonna be a blast of the essential beauty of the painting. And it's gonna be compositionally quite good now, it's not going to be perfect in every way by any means, 
because we're talking about three hours here, but it's going to be, you're going to see the color scheme in this by the time you close it out. I like to refer back to that idea and somebody who said about Sargent, and this is just about the visual order of effects and the coming out of the fog, but, but the young woman who was watching him said, and, 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 it, and the lights, it was like the lights came on. See, he's painting around with spots, and then he brings them together, making effects. By the time he closes that out, the lights are going to come on. You'll be able to see the quality of light in your painting. But do you see how many things we're trying to do in the start, in this matter of hours? So can you do that? Can you operate from an essential mindset so as to get to the end of the start in three hours and have it actually tell you, yes, this is going to be a an excellent picture. You won't be wasting your time pushing it to the degree of, of execution that you'd like. Um, now, so I think that's probably, um, yeah, I'm right where, I guess I'm right where I want to be. But that's, that's the sort of stuff that I find the most difficult things to communicate and the most difficult things for students to do. And I'm, I, I'm sorry, uh, Sean, if I'm not answering your questions, but I know that I'm answering questions you have. So, Again, thank you for David and Daniel um, uh, and for all of you guys out there making comments, asking questions. Um, I am looking for more, more um, queries. Uh, is there anything I can talk about that you want to talk about? I know I've, I've in the past not followed up uh, on certain kinds of people. You're asking me to talk about certain painters and stuff. If it relates to what we're doing, it helps me to uh, interpret it based on Boston School thinking. I'm not unhappy to do that. but. But in the meantime, what I really want to talk about is anything you're doing that's, that's in the category of uh, trying to elevate your thinking or trying to make you a better painter, rather as an impressionist. And if there's anything I can do, anything I can talk about, you know, in the area in which you're working right now, yeah, do, do put it to me. In the meantime, thank you for sharing and subscribing and all the rest. Much appreciated. Liking. <laughs> all right. So I hope you enjoy those three and that, that you can uh, make sense of them. Uh, over time, the uh, I did have a nice conversation with. Uh, I mean, one of you guys wrote to me on a comment and said, "I'm finding that the third time I'm I'm beginning to understand, really, or something like that, or I'm really beginning to get it, or I'm it's becoming it's being clearer all the time." And I appreciate that that you guys would stick in there. Uh, I'm not talking, you know, out of a book or out of. I'm not talking in the wind, you know. <laughs> I'm talking about what I've learned, what I've found to be most effective in this little world, the Impressionist world, uh, the world of painting from life holistically. Um, this whole idea of getting, having the color simultaneously working with the best possible drawing and all the rest, those sorts of things. So most of you know that already. All right, well, I'll see you in the next one. I think I'm gonna be doing an interview with Tom Dunley somewhere in the middle of all this or around it. So I'm gonna end here and uh, I hope you all have a great week. Well, hopefully uh, see you in the next one.